I once had a patient who told me that his wife and him spent so much money on arthritis medication and on weed that they decided to open a whole new bank account just for these two things. And uh, they call it a joint account. <laughs> and you know that it's pretty strange that uh, doctors are now prescribing cannabis for arthritis sufferers. I mean, the very definition of arthritis is inflammation of the joints. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Ryan here. Hope you and your family are well. Today we are addressing a very common medical topic, osteoarthritis. We're going to be uh, covering a clinical case and then we're going to be discussing osteoarthritis in terms of our seven cardinal headings, which are number one, etiology and risk factors, number two, pathophysiology, number three, patient presentation in the way of signs and symptoms, number four, differential diagnosis, number five, diagnostic evaluation in terms of investigations, number six, treatment and management, number seven, prognosis and complications, and then of course we're going to just cover a bit of scripture. God bless you, thanks for joining me, and uh, yeah, let's get stuck in guys. Which of the following is often spared by osteoarthritis? This is the clinical question we are posing today. Which of the following is spared by osteoarthritis? Is it A, the cervical spine, B, the distal interphalangeal joint, C, the hip, D, proximal interphalangeal joint, or is it E, the wrist? Hmm, nice to ask. Guys, osteoarthritis is a non-inflammatory disease, right, of the articular surface resulting in slowly progressive destruction of articular cartilage. It is also known as the degenerative joint disease. By the age of 65, the majority of the population has X-ray evidence of osteoarthritic changes at the knees, although many are asymptomatic of this. Right, looking at etiology, epidemiology, and risk factors of osteoarthritis, trauma leads to the release of degradative factors and inadequate repair by the chondrocytes. And afterwards, we have synthesis and secretion of matrix degrading enzymes like stromalizin, collagenase, and metalloproteinases by the chondrocytes. And this is markedly increased among these patients. Uh, then we have softening, ulceration, and focal disintegration of articular cartilage, which occur, leading to the formation of bony spurs, which is what we term osteophytes at the joint margins. Some inflammation does occur and is associated with mild joint warmth and effusion, but not to the degree that we see it in inflammatory arthritis. Okay, this is a beautiful diagram from Harrison's, demonstrating to us risk factors uh, for osteoarthritis, okay? And these we can stratify into being systemic factors, intrinsic joint factors, loading factors, right? Um, so these risk factors either contribute to the stability of the joint or increase risk by the load they impose on the joint. Usually a combination of loading and susceptibility factors are required to cause osteoarthritis or lead to its progression. Let's have a look. Systemic factors which affect joint vulnerability have to do with increasing age, female gender, racial or ethnic factors, genetic susceptibility, nutritional factors. Intrinsic joint vulnerability speaks to the local joint environment. So if the joint was previously damaged, example from a previous meniscectomy, bridging muscle weakness, increasing bone density, malalignment or proprioceptive deficiencies. Loading factors which impose themselves on the joint include obesity and injurious physical activities. All of this will lead to osteoarthritis or will lead to the progression of osteoarthritis in a joint in which the diagnosis is already established. Continuing, guys, um, it's very important for us to distinguish idiopathic osteoarthritis from secondary osteoarthritis, right? Idiopathic disease is usually associated with a family history and may be related to hereditary defects in the actual structure of collagen, more common in the hands and fingers. But secondary disease often occurs due to acute or repetitive trauma, joint hypermobility, congenital hip dysplasia, or Perthes disease, and other causes, right? Um, so osteoarthritis is more common in the load-bearing joints, which is primary or idiopathic flavor of osteoarthritis. It's more common in the load-bearing joints, such as the knees and the hips, and prevalence tends to increase with age. Obesity, obesity, guys, is a major risk factor for osteoarthritis of the knees, possibly at the hips, because it imposes a greater load on these joints. Sports participation in certain occupations may predispose to osteoarthritis, okay? So how do patients with OA present? Well, there is a deep, gnawing joint pain that increases with activity, subsides with rest. Morning stiffness less than 30 minutes. Now, these two characteristics delineate our uh, mechanical arthritis 
or our destructive arthritis from the inflammatory arthritis because the inflammatory arthritis we have prolonged morning stiffness right and the the, the joint pain tends to uh, abate with activity but increase with rest and that's the opposite of the scenario we see here right the most involved joints are i mean look at the diagram just now the hip the knees the distal interphalangeal joints the proximal interphalangeal joints the first metatarsophalangeal joint the first carpal metacarpal joint, and we also often have squaring of the thumb, as we will see, acromioclavicular joints and discs and facet joints of the spine. All right, and patients will present with mild joint swelling, and sometimes you have joint bony deformities may be present, especially in the hands, causing hibernant nodes at the distal interphalangeal joint and Bouchard's nodes at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Right, you often have bony enlargement, diminished and painful range of motion of these joints crepitus and tenderness on palpation. This is a beautiful diagram from Harrison's illustrating the joints commonly uh, involved in osteoarthritis or affected by osteoarthritis. So we said it involves the distal and the proximal interphalangeal joints. We spoke about Bouchard's and Herbertin's nodes. Bouchard's at the proximal interphalangeal and Herbertin's at the distal interphalangeal joint. The first carpal metacarpal joint causing so-called squaring of the thumb. It involves the cervical vertebrae, the lower lumbar vertebrae, the hips, the knees, and the first metatarsophalangeal joint. Uh, in the foot. Okay, this is a beautiful picture illustrating for us severe osteoarthritis affecting the hands. So we can see the um, involvement of the distal interphalangeal joints causing um, Herbertin's nodes and involvement of the proximal interphalangeal joints here causing um, Bouchard's nodes. Uh, there is no uh, clear bony enlargement uh, of other common sites in the hand. But you do see squaring of the thumb, right? Involvement of the first carpal metacarpal joint. All right. Now, this just illustrates the pathophysiology underpinning uh, osteoarthritis, right? So we said that um, the chondrocytes, bone, and synovium are all involved. The synovitis, which we see here, synovitis uh, causes release of cytokines, alarmins, and damps. Damp uh, is an acronym for damage associated molecular proteins and complement, which then activate chondrocytes through cell surface receptors. Chondrocytes produce matrix molecules in the way of chondrin 2 and aglycan and enzymes responsible for degradation of the matrix, which is Adam TS5 and matrix metalloproteinases. Bony invasion occurs through the calcified cartilage triggered by vascular endothelial growth factor, which we see here, and other molecules, right? Interleukins, transforming growth factor, tumor process factor are all implicated in the process, right? We also end up with bony remodeling, which underpins many of the nodes that we find in osteoarthritis, okay? What's the differential diagnosis for osteoarthritis, guys? Well, it could be an inflammatory arthritis in the way of uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, but remember that's inflammatory characteristics that we attribute to that, as opposed to non-inflammatory characteristics in OA. And it could be avascular necrosis, so watch out, especially in patients taking steroids. Uh, right, gouty arthritis, calcium pyrophosphate arthropathy, spondyloarthropathy, neuropathic joint related to endocrine disease, especially uh, diabetes. Uh, okay, septic arthritis, Reiter's syndrome, muscular skeletal disorders, and the way of tendonitis, bursitis. All of these can masquerade as OA. Polymyalgia, rheumatica, hemochromatosis, and trauma. Already, right? here's a very uh, entertaining uh, cartoon from uh, uh, midcomment.com. Thank you so much, Mr. Jorge Munas and company. All right, illustrating the prime differences between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So OA is a degenerative disease, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. In osteoarthritis, you have morning stiffness, which lasts by definition less than 30 minutes, but RA, being an inflammatory arthritis, has morning stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes, right? And then other features include involvement of the DIP and the PIP, so Hebron's nose, Beauchamp's nose. This illustrates the distribution. So DIP, PIP, first carpal metacarpal, first metatarsophalangeal joint, C-spine, L-spine, hip, knees, hips, knees, and first metatarsophalangeal joint, okay? That's in osteoarthritis. But rheumatoid arthritis is symmetrical, small joint polyarthritis, typically affecting your uh, distal interphalangeal, proximal interphalangeal, your carpal metacarpal, your wrist joints bilaterally, elbow joints, your shoulder joints, okay, the C-spine is commonly involved, the knees, the ankles, right, and the metatarsophalangeal joints and the uh, PIPs, all right. It doesn't really often have prediction for the DIPs, more the PIPs, that's too much out of that side. And you also have a whole host of extra-articular involvement and, of course, you have serology as well. In OA, the prime thing is cartilage loss, pathophysiologically speaking, but in rheumatoid arthritis, it's inflammation, right? An inflamed synovium. Okay, guys, talking about diagnostics now. 
right as we know the pillars or the tenets of medicine is history and physical exam so on that in osteoarthritis, you get a history of trauma because that's going to allude more to secondary OA, sports participation in terms of wear and tear on those joints, obesity, poor conditioning, minuscule tear may be present, physical findings of crepitus, diminished range of motion, and bony enlargement are common, right? Then you want to do a diagnostic evaluation. The first part of call is x-rays. X-ray of the involved joint may reveal joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, osteophyte formation, subchondral cysts. Joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, osteophyte formation, subchondral cysts. Those are the common findings in x-ray. And if indeed there is a joint effusion and you go and you aspirate it, synovial fluid is going to show you few white blood cells, less than 25% of polymorphonucleus. Oh, sorry about the typo there. There's going to be no crystals and it has normal viscosity. Test of inflammation like your erythrocyte sedimentation rate, the C-reactive protein, usually normal, right? Rheumatoid factor titers are less than 1 is to 40, so those are negative essentially. And if septic arthritis is suspected, you want to assess the full blood count, the blood culture, and send off that synovial fluid in the joint for gram stain and culture. Other tests may be indicated to identify an inflammatory arthropathy, so if you're not really sure if this is degenerative or if this is inflammatory, do your anti-nuclear factor, do your anti double standard DNA. And if it's inflammatory, inevitably the inflammatory markers, the ESR, the CRP should be up. This is a beautiful x-ray from Harrison showing us the uh, joint disease of OA at the knee in an X-ray. X-ray here is going to show beautiful osteophytes, right? Osteophytes at the medial and lateral tibia and femur and joint space narrowing. See how narrow this joint space is, right? Of the medial tibial femoral joint. Coronal intermediate weighted fat suppressed MRI confirms the presence of medial and lateral, medial and lateral osteophytes and medial femoral joint space narrowing. Look at how narrow this joint space is. There is diffuse denuded area with no cartilage remaining at the weight bearing medial femoral joint here. There is also severe medial meniscus extrusion, right, um, which is here, sorry, De depicted by the arrowhead, right. Uh, cartilage focal deficits are also seen at the lateral weight bearing femur and tibia, right. Okay guys, let's talk about therapeutics. Now there's no real therapeutic intervention which has been shown to prevent the development of osteoarthritis or slow down the progression of damage in joints that are already involved or to reverse the pathophysiological process. Non-pharmacological therapies include low impact exercise, physical therapy and weight loss in obese patients. Topical capsaicin is often effective for mild to moderate pain, paracetamol or non steroidals for Pain. Interarticular steroids may be given for severe pain, but generally not used more frequently than every four to six months. Okay. Visco supplementation with hyaluronic acid and injections may preserve and or replenish articular cartilage, but have and have been shown to decrease pain for about six months. Glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate may be useful, although the evidence is somewhat mixed. Surgical interventions are often necessary for advanced disease, which may include joint replacement. Okay. This is a, a table from Harrison showing us our different therapeutic options when it comes to osteoarthritis. So we divide this table into treatment, dosage, and comments. So commonly we can use oral non and COX-2 inhibitors, right? Like celecoxib is good. Ibuprofen is fraught with side effects, right? Naproxen uh, as well as a non -steroidal. Those are the appropriate doses. Look, you gotta take these with food. It increases the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. non also cause fluid retention. Right, there's a high rate of gastrointestinal side effects, especially if you're using the COX-1 inhibitors, right, including ulcers and bleeding. Patients at high risk for GI side effects should also either take a PPI uh, or mesoprostol together with the non steroidal. There's uh, an increase in GI side effects of bleeding when taken with acetylsalicylic acid. It can also cause edema and renal insufficiency. Watch out, right? Topical non steroidals are very good, especially diclofenac, 1% gel, which is Voltaren. Right, you can rub onto the joint, has few systemic side effects. Uh, skin irritation is common. So, paracetamol is great, but it's of limited efficacy and only conditionally recommended. Opiates, common side effects include dizziness, sedation, nausea, vomiting, dry mouth, right? Constipation, urinary retention, and pruritus. Those are all the uh, anticholinergic effects. It's less efficacious than a non steroidal. Capsaicin topically can irritate and cause membranes. Interarticular injections may have steroids and hyaluronans. Um, for mild to moderate pain at the injection site is, is a common adverse effect. Controversy exists regarding efficacy, okay? In terms of prognostication and complications, uh, osteoarthritis has an insidious grumbling onset 
with chronic and sometimes debilitating sequelae. Symptoms can be treated by the progression of disease is unaffected. Ultimately, many patients with advanced disease will eventually require surgical treatment. Now, the results of surgical intervention are usually quite favorable and allow patients to return to all or most of the activities of daily living, allows them to ambulate, and that obviously improves their confidence and their independence, can result in a significant decrease in the quality of life, um, decrease activity, and loss of uh, independence in the elderly, right? Um, that's, you know, if obviously the intervention is not that successful or if the patient opts not for the intervention. Medication-induced complications can occur and may address the risk of GI bleeding in non steroidal So guys, back to our clinical question. Which of the following is often spared by osteoarthritis? And the answer is the wrist. Right? Because inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, loves the wrist, but wrist is not commonly involved in osteoarthritis. And these, once again, this uh, represents the different joints involved in osteoarthritis. So we said that is the DIP and the PIP, the Beauchard's, the hibernance, the first carpal metacarpal, the C-spine, the lower lumbar spine, the hips, the knees, and the first metatarsophalangeal joint, not the wrists, okay? Okay, I hope you just allow me to encourage you for a few moments from the Bible. Did you know that we are all made in the image of God? Genesis 127 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. First John 4, 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. My friends, we are made in the image of God. And God is holy. God is powerful. And God is love. So as a child of God, we have the DNA of the Father. So we should also be holy as He is holy. We should be powerful. But that power is to accomplish His will. Right? And we should show love. Love for God, love for our fellow men, love for our neighbors, wherever we should go. Love, love, love. Okay, here are my references. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining me. You can find me on Facebook. My page on Facebook is entitled Internal Medicine Algorithms and Mnemonics. You can also catch me on Instagram and TikTok. We're going to be talking soon about the vast, common, prevalent, important topic of type 2 diabetes mellitus. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.